Hi, my name is Mario Caro. I'm the director of the Ma uh, Master of Fine Arts here at, at the Institute of American Indian Arts. And I wanna welcome you to our third and final lecture that um, have been programmed as part of our summer institute here at the MFA. It's our first one, so we've been pretty excited about all of the uh, happenings here. Um, <clears throat> first, uh, before I go on, I wanna thank uh, Jason Ordaz, Nicole Law, Andy Prim, uh, and all of the other folks who have made this uh, machine operate in terms of us uh, getting on um, online here. Um, I want to say something about the location we're coming from. We're located on the traditional lands of the Tewa and Tiwa peoples. Uh, we make who they make up uh, 19 the 19 Pueblo communities uh, that are uh, part of what is now called New Mexico. This is the um, you know, this is this is part part of the theme for this week has been a discussion of uh, the notion of the avant-garde, and we've titled it "Beyond an Indigenous Avant-Garde" uh, to sort of anticipate this this idea that that uh, um, a concept such as this um, needs to be uh, superseded. Uh, one of the things we've been trying to do is to uh, load an already loaded term, uh, lo load further. And by loading, I don't mean, or although it is part of what uh, <clears throat> what's on the table for discussion, uh, I don't mean loading in terms of a, a weapon, uh, but um, also what we're really talking about is uh, loading as in terms of a burden, uh, you know, kind of in increasing its weight, its capacity, its excess, um, what have you. So this, this has been a, a pretty interesting uh, set of discussions around, under, besides avoiding uh, the term. But um, I'm so excited to have Nolan uh, Dennis with us today. He's an interdisciplinary artist from Johannesburg, South Africa, whose practices explores uh, the material and metaphysical conditions of decolonization, questioning the politics of space and time uh, through a system-specific rather than site-specific approach. He holds a bachelor's degree in architecture um, from the University of uh, Witwatersrand, I hope I pronounced that right, and, in, and an MS in art, culture, and technology from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He's a founding member of uh, Tech Healing Agency, NTU, as well as the Index Literacy Program, a research uh, project between the US, Brazil, and South Africa. Uh, he's a research associate at the Visual Identities in Art and Design Center at the University of Johannesburg, uh, a Digital Earth Fellow in the Planetary Sensorium program there, uh, and a 2021 artist in residence at NTU CCA uh, Singapore. He's currently co editor of Indexing Imaginaries part of the data browser book series published by Open Humanities Press. Welcome, Nolan. Uh, thank you, hi. Uh, hi, Mario uh, and everyone. Um, yeah, it's an absolute pleasure uh, and honor to be here. Um, should I just get into it? How does... <laughs> okay, um, well, uh, okay, I'm going to share screen, and whilst I do that, I'm going to say it's, um, it's not really uh, in my kind of political tradition to do a land acknowledgement, um, but it really is a, an honor uh, and a privilege to share the space um, between here uh, Johannesburg and yeah, everywhere right now. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna start. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna share some, some images um, and I'm not gonna talk directly to them. Uh, these are all images of my work um, and they're all works that are works that are in series or either kind of cycles of works um, where kind of each work is constantly reworked uh, and every time it's kind of shown and shared it's a kind of extension uh, of the life of the work um, which yeah causes some 
kind of uh, indexing issues. Um, but I think it's the nature of the work to to want to shift uh, and to kind of exist in different configurations and different forms. Um, this talk is basically uh, going to be an attempt to answer this question, uh, which hopefully is a useful question. Uh, it's a question that I was forced to grapple with uh, in my MFA. Um, so hopefully it's useful for uh, this cohort. Um, the question is something like, like this. Uh, how should we, who are minimally alienated from the hegemonic system of production of knowledge relate to the techniques and tools of knowledge production dominant in the colonial or neo-colonial conditions we find ourselves in. As like maybe a complicated way of asking, what should we do? We who for one reason or another find ourselves in proximity to and within what is often called the master's tools. Uh, what should we do with them? Um, this question has in conscious and unconscious, intentional and uh, kind of haphazard ways shaped my own practice um, and is becoming more and more central to how I approach my work. Um, the first thing to consider is uh, I guess like what are these tools and techniques of knowledge production? Like what are these master's tools? Um, and I guess the more I've thought about them, um, the more I realize that defining them becomes a kind of impossible task since the position of the master, right? Like uh, the kind of colonial master mobilizes everything as a tool to its own end, including ourselves. Um, and uh, I guess I understand those ends uh, like kind of simplistically as to reproduce its own power. Um, kind of master works to reproduce the master um, and we get sucked into that project one way or another. Um, and that power, um, I kind of understand as a structure of the world, like uh, a master slave relation with humans at the top and varying degrees of sub human and non-human below, where the model human is always a, a white man, white male, um, and everything is mobilized to either make us more and more like white men or to distinguish us more precisely and more, uh, more precisely from white men and more efficiently distribute rights and responsibilities, violence, death, peace and pleasure according to that distinction. Um, and this shape, this kind of structure, I think uh, is what people, or what I understand when people talk about the master's house. Um, so this is, uh, yeah, I mean, it's kind of sneaky because I guess everything can be used to reinforce the foundations of this house. Um, so, so the urge to kind of separate from it can be reinforced, can be used to reinforce the distinction which places us in relative deprivation from them. Um, the urge to occupy this house can be used to reinforce uh, proximity to whiteness as a measure of humanness, um, which is something kind of like the pitfalls uh, of colonial difference. Um, you know, the, to become either the difference that makes no difference or to be the outside, which secures the boundaries of the inside. Um, which is all to kind of say that in this house, pretty much everything is a master's tool, a tool doing the work of the master. Um, of course, we, uh, I uh, am super grateful to Audrey Lord, who tells us that the master's tools cannot dismantle the master's house. Um, but I was recently listening to Ruth Gilmore Wilson, um, who made a really like kind of offhanded remark, um, which was like a really small remark in the flow of what she was saying, but it was really critical intervention into my understanding. Um, and I, it like kind of, yeah, kind of crystallized something that I would, arrived at a point where I like kind of was desperately needing this intervention. Uh, and what, what she said is that, uh, the master's tools is really a question of ownership and possession. 
Um, it's about the tools which belong to the master. Uh, and this is a really important point I'd like to make kind of in this talk. Um, and it's a really important, important point that I'm always kind of returning to in my practice, um, which is kind of saying that a master's tool is not an ontological status of a thing, that this is a master's tool and this is not a master's tool, but it's a relationship between things. So it's something like this is being used to reinforce the master's project. Um, and this is being used to undermine the master's project. Um, and this distinction creates a kind of opening, uh, I guess, in the flow of power. Uh, and importantly for my work, um, it gives me a kind of way to get into things that isn't like, completely depressing. You know, it's, uh, to learn about the kind of history of art can often just be so depressing. Um, but if there's a way in which the, uh, the relationships with, which maintain that or, or kind of describe that history uh, can be shifted, then there's a possibility that that thing, that really kind of boring Western thing might have another life. Uh, and that's maybe what I'm really, really interested in. Um, is to say that there's a kind of network or a community of relations which uh, support a thing, um, anything, uh, and in this case, like a master's thing, right? Um, and we want to create, like, anyway, let me not say that. <laughs> um, uh, from where I am, uh, any question about possession or belonging um, tends to move into a kind of relation of dispossession. Um, so in this case, master's tools are not only the things that we're caught in, kind of inescapably bound by, um, but they're simultaneously things that we're denied access to. And here access also means access to shaping the relations which determine the meaning of things, the meaningfulness and the potential that things have. Uh, and in my practice, um, potential is an important quality. Um, potential or possibility um, is a kind of condition for transformation. And I'm like really invested in transformation. Um, but at the same time, you could also say that kind of impossibility is a condition for transformation or, or maybe better to say impossibility necessitates transformation. Um, so you'd say something like, we have to change things not because we can change them, but because even though we cannot change them or they cannot be changed, they still must, they must still change. Like this kind of like structure, uh, this like relation, this kind of possible impossibility uh, kind of dance is really important. Uh, and I think in a, like the kind of linear colonial sense of the world, that's a, that's a paradox. Um, but that, for me, that's totally fine. You know, we, we're completely paradoxical um, and 100% like outside of the orthodox, or at least we're trying to be. You know? um, so these uh, hegemonic tools and techniques of knowledge production, uh, the like whole awful European tradition, of enlightenment and modernity, the quantitative and linear model of knowledge, Cartesian traps, planetary logics, anthropologics of humanity rendered through whiteness. Um, this whole category we could just call like master's tools. And then underneath that, there are a whole set of aesthetics, technologies, protocols, conventions, ways of working and seeing and acting. And these things, um, I mean, these are kind of the things that we have to confront uh, and ask these questions. At least these are the things that I am constantly confronting um, in order to ask this question, like what do they, what do they mean for us? Um, and I, you know, uh, speaking in public is difficult because when I say us, it's complicated, um, but I probably mean, uh, 
those of us who know another world is necessary, um, who come from like a tradition of dispossession and also tradition of persistence. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, the question is like, what do, yeah, what do they mean for us? What do they mean when it's both impossible to change them and simultaneously absolutely necessary to change? And for me, uh, the answer to this question comes from an understanding or from understanding what it means to take spirituality seriously. Um, this is gonna be a very rough sketch, um, but let's just say like the basis of spirituality is an understanding that everything has something extra, like a moriti, a shadow, there's like an, under, there's an, an underside or maybe just another side to everything. Um, there's a part of us, which is both us and not us, right? Like there's a part of us um, which is kind of quantifiable, you know, our material bodies, it's describable, it's presentable, addressable, identifiable, but there's also a part of us which is not that, which is more than what we are now. Um, there's a quality of being that kind of pertains to all of the things that we could be and, somehow also are, you know. Um, these are like radically open and transformable, extensive across time and space and possibility and abstract and like, you know, I guess like a spirit, you know. Um, and, I, and for me, this, the spiritual pertains always to this extra, this part of the world, which we are not yet and yet some, somehow really very much are. Um, and a spiritual practice then is like, for me, a set of protocols for living with this extra, for carrying all of this possibility and using it to transform our conditions like every day, um, which is just all to kind of say at some point, I got to the sense that all of these tools, right? These tools that are in a relationship with the master currently also have some spiritual otherwise, some potential. They, they like all things have relational value um, and that even diagrams and other kinds of thinking machines might have some other life. You know? They might have some other possibility uh, to live out. Uh, and that my own assumptions, and I think this is maybe really important um, about their meaningfulness might reinforce a colonial relation of possibility. And so it's, maybe the most useful thing to just start putting them in relation with other things, you know, to see if these tools and techniques might become allies in a struggle for some kind of general possibility. You know? um, and for me, all of this, uh, this kind of um, relational strategy of transformation really comes out of what I understand um, from kind of spiritual practices of transformation. Um, and yeah, if I use the word relation purposely uh, because it's not simply a question of adopting an aesthetic or adopting a style of working or kind of adopting these tools, even though like adoption implies care, um, but it's actually, it's a question of redistributing uh, the relations that describe these tools, you know, like it's a question of putting them into other kinds of real social, economic and cultural relations. It's really about like changing what these things do and who they're in relation with that give them meaning. Um, and yeah, I mean, this in my practice was like this kind of moment, um, but it's not actually such a radical idea. Um, colonized people, you know, my people, colonized people all around the world uh, have a deep and long tradition of transforming colonial technologies into tools of, te into tools of liberation, um, both in like the grand political sense and in the everyday sense of survival and perseverance. Um, and all of the things that are 
radical enough to have brought us to this point. Um, and so I, I, I'm trying to work very much uh, within that tradition. Um, you know, this tradition of like taking what's given and uh, making something more, you know? Um, and it, it, yeah, I mean, this sense of working within a tradition has an added be benefit because sometimes um, like it, doing, especially doing artwork and some, some of the work that I do, like sometimes I feel like I'm really on the edge of like being useful, you know, like it just seems a bit useless. Um, but even though I might feel kind of like out there, I don't, I never really feel alone um, because I know we've been doing this for a very long time. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think the thing I'd like to, yeah, I think I'd like to get to like all of this is to say like, at some point it became very clear to me that the people who know least of all what things are for or capable of are the ones who impose them on us. Um, mm -hmm. That the colonial and neo-colonial uh, deployment of technology more often than not misses the point of that technology um, which is maybe that there is no point, um, but maybe better that there are multiple points um, which are only viable through uh, attending to and con constantly maybe, I don't know, transforming the disposition of technology by putting it into community and working out in community what this tool will be for us. Um, and the struggle, to kind of paraphrase uh, Audre Lorde again, uh, is to take what is useful and leave what is wasteful. Um, and our work is really the practice of distinguishing, you know, the really hard practice of distinguishing between what is useful and what is wasteful. Uh, what are we doing for time? Plenty. Don't worry about okay. it. Um, I want to talk now just about a specific project um, called, uh, it's, it's had like multiple names. Um, I'm just going to call it like Gathering Sound. And it's a project about trains. Um, it's a project I've been working on with uh, Dana Wabira, an artist from Zimbabwe, and Tendin Gosi Koniwe, an <laughs> art historian from South Africa. Um, uh, and it's, yeah, it's really, it's just a project about trains. It's pretty, uh, yeah, banal, but I, I really love it. Um, I, so this, uh, this is Suchaba, um, this is the 1976 edition, and it's a journal of uh, the main uh, liberation movement in South Africa. Um, and in this edition, 1976 is a really critical year in South Africa. I won't get into why. Um, but in this edition, at some point, there's this map of Southern Africa's railway networks. And it, it isn't really like contextualized. It's just kind of placed there. Um, and it, it, like it was this kind of, um, this kind of prompt, this kind of you know, confusing encounter. Um, and you know, the, our understanding of trains, at least let's say before we started on this project was really um, as a kind of uh, tech, like a critical colonial technology, you know, this, this network is really set up in order to transport raw materials from the interior of the continent to the coast um, to be loaded onto ships and sent to the industrial centers in North America and Europe. Um, the, I mean, the secondary function is also to move migrant labor uh, from the interior to uh, the mines, uh, to the ports. Um, and so the, so the train network has always had this kind of deep entanglement with a kind of horrific history. Um, but this, this map is in the journal of 
the liberation organization, liberation movement, which at the time was fighting a guerrilla war against the apartheid state. And so the like second uh, really obvious reading is as a, a kind of uh, an anatomy of sabotage, you know, this is like what to target, you know, how to, uh, mm. yeah, stop the flows, right? Um, so there's, a, there's also a kind of counter map and both like the, the, the map of power and its counter map of the same map, you know, there's a, um, so that kind of got us interested in it, but uh, talking to people and trying to understand like kind of why the, the train network would just emerge, um, we, mm. we came across this really incredible story uh, and the song. And the song, Hamba Non Tokolo, is um, the first like kind of number one hit song in South Africa. Um, written and performed by an indigenous black person. Um, so it is it's like this kind of uh, like kind of pop cultural moment in the 50s. Um, I'm gonna play like a little bit of it. Um, I hope it's not too loud, but it's important to hear it. Humba, humba, not so cool, Kappa, kappa so jinela, hamba non tsukolo. Hare lari, hamba, hamba non tsukolo koli, koli kuyai wa kappa, kappa so jinela, hamba non tsukolo. Oh, seni no na. Wow, 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 wow. Um. So this, uh, like maybe 50 years later, yeah. I think 2005, um, Dorothy Masuko is giving an interview and talking about the song. And she spoke about writing, writing the song as a student going to boarding school uh, on the train um, and writing it to the cadence of the train. So they're like, um, and then going into the studio and trying to uh, get the musicians to kind of reproduce this. Um, but, but the story really opens up and kind of forced us to think about the trains differently. Um, and you first have to start thinking about the train uh, and this train network, not only in this kind of um, oppressor, oppressed dichotomy or dialectic, but uh, in this kind of additional thing, which is hard to place in that, um, the train as an instrument, as a kind of musical instrument, like the, the carriage as a sound box, um, the network as a huge, like collective instrument, um, which kind of led us to start thinking about what trains were made for, you know? uh, which is a kind of a ridiculous question because they're made to, uh, move human bodies around and to take uh, stones to the harbor. Um, but it occurred to us that actually this, this question is even more ridiculous than that, because um, while the colonialists were the ones that were kind of, um, let's say they provided the capital and the like, violent infrastructure to produce the network, they were not the only people making the trains. They're not the only people making the train network. Um, the vast majority of labor to build the trains was our labor, it was indigenous African labor. Um, in a very real way, uh, we built those networks. Um, and, uh, you know, thinking about this and thinking about labor, opened up a whole additional set of stories. Um, I don't know if, okay, no, this is gonna be good. Um, my favorite story is a story, there's like a whole series of newspaper articles and like a kind of folktale popular uh, history of lion attacks 
building these railways. These are, I mean, primarily built by the British. Um, sorry. Um, they're primarily built by the British and there's these stories of lion attacks. And, you know, there are these like human, what do they call them? Like man killers, you know, these lions that were uh, attacking the laborers and, but there's a there's a count there's a, there's a really great counter story, and the story is that uh, people would be hired to work on these long contracts. These are kind of like indentured labor contracts, and so people would work and work and work and get kind of tired of working and want to go home. Um, but if they left, they'd lose their they'd lose their pay. They wouldn't be paid, and so people would make up stories about or. Let me put it in, in better words. Um, there was this ongoing alliance between the people and the lions. And the lions would arrive and some people would disappear. And this assemblage, this little community around the railway would allow people to return home and um, legally um, force the colonial state to pay out their labor. So there's this kind of complex um, negotiation happening there um, around this thing, you know, like this, these, these railways are not just um, what we, uh, we sim you know, the kind of simplistic um, colonial narrative, but also and have always been wrapped up in kind of strategies of, um, yeah, of, of producing something else, you know? Um, and of course, all of this really is about uh, labor relations. Not, maybe not really, but uh, it's partly about labor relations. And when we think about um, labor relations and talk about labor relations in relation to the trains, you led back to music. Uh, and this song I'll play a little bit, this is a, a Zambian song um, and it's a work song. It's also, it's about Chitima uh, is a train and it's about trains. Um, um, yeah, and, and this uh, relationship between music and labor and space and colonial history is really, um, I mean, it's something that I think many people in this region um, know intuitively, but it's like, I mean, there's so many train songs. You know, part of this project um, was creating this playlist of train songs from around the region. Um, in South Africa, we have this really famous song, Shoshua which is like an alternative national song, and it's a train song. Train songs, um, they, I mean, of all of the kind of machines to sing a song about, for some reason, uh, and not an arbitrary reason, um, the train seems to attract or has historically attracted um, this kind of whole musical world. Um, there's a whole genre of struggle songs and pop songs and folk songs around the train. Um, and it's not, I'm not gonna play this. Um, and it's not uh, arbitrary. Um, so, all of that wonderful work uh, kind of led to this, yeah, <laughs> somewhat disappointing uh, diagram. Um, but but I think the you know the 
the richness of like what emerges from the train um, points to something kind of really important and maybe to tie into what I'm trying to get at with this whole talk um, is that the, you know, the, the railway, um, in addition to its kind of awful colonial collaboration, um, what it also does simultaneously and maybe even more vehemently uh, is undermine the logic of colonial geography. Um, the kind of basic logic of colonial spatial planning is about um, separation, right? It's about like segregation and um, the imposition of hard boundaries, right? Of taking um, the world as this kind of open field and, and kind of compartmentalizing it into ownable patches. Uh, the, the logic of uh, the colonial logic, which is still very much with us, is a, is a logic of borders, right? Um, and where uh, the colonizers want to separate, or let's, I don't know what to call them anymore, they're everything. Um, what the train does and what it has to do is connect. The, the, the train renders borders porous. Um, and so while uh, the financiers in London and New York financing these projects um, with the agenda of, to some degree of stabilizing their own power, uh, the people who are making these networks in real space are creating a kind of a, a secret technology to undermine that project. Um, and this, for me, um, is a kind of really important, uh, a really important lesson about kind of why, <laughs> why I do the kind of work I do, um, because it, 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 it I want to say something, but I, I'm really... <laughs> not my place to say it you know this is maybe the core of the insecure channel uh, structure but um, I guess there's just more you know there's more at stake and there's more possibility within the things that we're surrounded by than we are encouraged to consider you know we're, we're kind of um, encouraged to take these things at face value and uh, I mean, I don't want to talk too much about value, but I, I know that they don't know much about what's valuable, you know, and, and in all of these, um, in all of these tools and technologies, there's much more uh, to be done. I'm going to leave it there. Um, and they would never know. How's that? Um, so this, yeah, so this is the project that became a, a series of kind of diagrams uh, that, yeah, they, they kind of distort um, kind of geographic space um, and uh, privilege other forms of connection and they're annotated with, with songs. Um, and there's an additional diagram, which is a diagram of um, kind of uh, ownership and finance, financing of these railways, along with the kind of workers' rail, uh, workers' unions that emerged from the railway. And these workers' unions were the, um, they were kind of like the, I don't want to call them labs, but they were, they were where um, some of the first uh, hard Pan-African organizing happened. And it was because these workers could move across borders and so could produce a kind of politics that was um, denied in other spaces, you know, connecting struggles across countries, uh, so-called countries, um, across uh, space, you know, and across time. So it's kind of the shape of the project. It had a very uh, awkward phase where it was shown in Germany um, and I, 
I really love this image because I really hate this image. Um, it just kind of crystallizes the kind of structure of the art world. Um, but it, it did have, I mean, this is kind of perfect. The, the, you know, music is such an important part of this project. Um, and there's a museum in Germany that has uh, like an original early radio from Southern Africa. These were like native radios given out to um, people, workers mostly. And this is how people, how these songs became kind of popular, the pop songs at least. Uh, and so there's this uh, German institution that has one of these, but they would only allow us to use it if it was placed in this uh, exclusion zone. Um, it was, yeah, but all in all, just a pretty disappointing experience. But um, it did have some other lives. This was an installation in Mombasa. Um, and yeah, this was in uh, Congo, in Kinshasa. Um, and yeah, it's anyway, I don't want to go get into that. <laughs> uh, I, I think I'm going to end. Uh, just, I think I'll, I'll say one last thing um, about avant-garde. Uh, and I love this phrasing beyond an indigenous avant-garde um, because it takes an indigenous avant-garde for granted. It says, at least the way I read it, um, it says that we're already beyond that, um, which is true. Um, I speak for my context where I think like the, how avant-garde is uh, in our everyday acts of survival and we have been surviving for so long. Um, there's, there's a common trope that like kind of my pet hate um, when talking about uh, indigenous projects um, and it has to do with being first. Uh, I grew up in South Africa, like just after apartheid ended um, and I grew up in an era where everything and everyone was first um, and it, being first is uh, it's it's also a very lonely place you know um, you're the first I mean you know like being the first black student in a white school this is really like the the first black architect this is like the language of everything you know um, first black president, these, these things have kind of haunted me uh, all my life. And, and I, I feel like while this sense of being first is kind of like pedantically true, its meaningfulness is based on like reifying colonial assumptions of value. I was thinking about um, this situation and being like the kind of first, um, MFA, Indigenous Art MFA, um, which is something to be so proud of and like such an important achievement for all of us. Um, but the achievement is not in its firstness, but in how arriving it transforms the institution of the MFA itself, um, which to kind of get back to the master's tools, um, I, I feel like we adopt these structures, these tools and techniques of knowledge production in order to transform them to our own ends, um, which are not new and are not alone and are not first. Um, we're in this long history. Um, and so now the history of the MFA must include the cultural work and the pedagogy of all of our precedents, things that until now have had nothing to do with MFAs. Um, and if they are now there in an MFA, um, then the MFA has changed. You know? It's the first change, um, which means also that to be first is not to be alone, um, but just to be a, like a particular expression of a long, long story. Um, my last thing is in our collective culture in South Africa, we have an indigenous philosophy called Ubuntu. Um, in its most 
reduced form, it's represented by the phrase umuntu, gumuntu, babantu. A person is a person through other people. Um, which we can extend to think the meaningfulness of a thing is brought through its relations with other things. Um, so when we in the black, indigenous and queer worlds work so closely to the tools and techniques of Western colonial knowledge production, we have a special responsibility to transform those tools by rearranging and creating new relations to give them other meaning, or maybe to give them meaning for the first time. Um, yeah, that's just what I think. Thank you. Nolan, thank you so much for that. Uh, I think you're, uh, I, I, <laughs> I think our students are probably agape right now. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, there's so much I'm really looking forward to our discussion immediately uh, after this. But um, yeah, I just, I can't help but uh, the, hone in on that one part. Well, there's so many incredible things you raised, but th this whole thing about the capacity of tools not being fully understood by, by the master and that the tools themselves, you know, there's all this discussion about bricolage and this sort of like, Oh my God! Native folks are making stoves out of tin cans, uh, you know, and and it's um, just this inability to kind of see capacity, potential, usefulness, value, as you put it, relations. Um, so thank you so much, um, and thank you all for for joining us. Uh, we'll announce our next uh, set of uh, talks uh, soon. So please uh, follow us on social media. Thanks so much. Thanks.